Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, it's a struggle, like so many architects do, our, our place in the world and, and, and what defines architecture. We have to be careful. One you know, of the other definitions is sort of artful, which when you think of the artful dodger is often taking the, the thing that architects actually do do well is sort of the canniness of their operation and, and can become sort of artful, but it often has means other aspects of their enterprise rather than, rather than the application of intellectual ideas and craft and infusing the sort of the gamut of the range of creative thought process into the act of making that, that um, generally defines art. So we're, we're part players. The demands upon architects is often not to be, to actually further remove us from the process of art. And in our practice, we find every possible way to align ourselves more and more with creative practice and where we can, particularly with our association with artists, with art practice. So I've sort of put things into sort of categories. And one is inventing practice. One thing. Um, that I do like about our practice and it's far from the enterprise of one person. We often talk about, even though the practice has just turned 30, about inventing and constantly inve inventing and re redefining the nature of practice. And in doing that, in our mode of operation, is very much to sort of call upon our staff and dig deep into the, the vast uh, creative coalition of the many people that take part in our practice. For all of that, we see the series of leaps, the leaps from a small home, a very influential house, our Bell Downing Beach House many years ago now, and the great leap into those first opportunities. And very often we find it's those great enterprises where architects are called on to doing something that's new to them, that's not part of conve their conventional practice, that we are, at, with, with, through the research and the care that we take, as when we approach the nature of our work, most closely to the way that artists research and develop the, uh, the great leap forward that they'll often do in, a, in some vast creative enterprise. And for us, one of these was this is, um, one of two famous images, famous within our practice. Um, I've been convincing Daniel Grollo and the board of, of Grocon that we, yes, we had only ever done a single story and an occasional double story house, but we could end up doing a 40-storey building for him because really it was just a matter of stacking all of our houses end on end. And <laughs> for some reason, that moment of artfulness um, hit him and the board and we, and we produced our QV2 project. But we are now a larger practice. We're 78 this, uh, at, at the moment and we are a practice that very much derives itself from a remarkable creative coalition, something we, we invest so greatly in. Uh, as we call upon the skills of many. Spare my indulgence because I was told to by Charles, so back into then the, the me in, in the us, and it comes back to a rather romantic story that I'll tell you very quickly. I grew up in Geelong, childhood in the 1960s. My father was uh, a, a, a very much invested in the heritage of Geelong, in the Geelong Historical Society as a relatively young research scientist. One of his best, one of his close associates was Ken Burns, the wrecker who at that time was demolishing Geelong. And so I, as a small boy, spent so many Saturday mornings while my father and Ken would debate the latest atrocity that Ken had wrought on pulling down much of Geelong. And if you've been to Geelong, you know my father and his group in the uh, in his uh, group of well-meaning, well-intended um, members of the Geelong Historical Society were particularly unsuccessful as a lot of the group. Um, but what Ken did keep for Dad was all the memorial stones of every building he ever demolished, and we added them to this vast garden wall that we are I'm standing in front of it that my father took mm -hmm. probably a decade and a half to build in central Geelong. What that talked to me was two things. One was the complexity of life. Two people that could have polar part decisions could actually converse, and I think in the world we exist in at the moment, it's a nice lesson to be learned. But it's also, as I looked at Ken Burns' yard at the time, it was a remarkable place. He catalogued everything he, de he demolished. There's about 10 acres of, most of which was outside, the refuse of all these buildings, the stone, the bricks, the timber, the rudimentary part of stuff, and that was out there being weathered and, and, uh, and, and unprotected. But in a series of massive industrial sheds, was his perfect cataloguing the, the, the remarkable parts of the architecture of Geelong that he was demolishing, the finials and staircases and windows, things that had the touch of human hand most pronounced on them. And he carefully catalogued the way, those away. And the romantic recollection I would have then is, is the, uh, the adventure that I had of most Saturdays of climbing through these things gave me the appreciation 
of things that have the worth of human endeavour most pronounced upon them. So my particular interest within the practice is often getting down and absorbing into the detail of a coffee table based on a, a single item of, of this teapot uh, that forms part of the dynamic of a family's association or in, in designing a dining table for a client, looking very much at the co coalition of a of family and friends around a dining table, or the, as it most recently in, in, a, in the latest table we've just designed, a husband and wife that are complete opposites. I can't understand how their marriage has been sustained. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of Venus and Mars that's the centrepiece of the dining table. <laughs> um, and again, this, this aspect of the fine detail, one year when, uh, and particularly half a year, I designed a breakfast in bed tray for them all. Um, these sorts of things, this is a particularly interesting project where for a friend who is an absolute zealot about the perfection of the iPhone and, and, and chastised me for having an iPhone cover around the iPhone 5 that we both bought that same week, I designed him his very own iPhone cover. It has all of the binary aspects of pencil, magnifying glass and post -it notes and <laughs> <laughs> conveniently sits on a belt strap that I also designed. <laughs> so this fascination with detail is one thing that I do probably bring per very personally to the practice. And interesting with the aspect of outlook and the way um, the elevation of a house and, or any building really is our connection with the world beyond and the way we as architects can orchestrate that collection through. So for a house built a few years ago in Lake Wendouree and a discussion with our clients about whether they have a front wall or not because they were concerned about the massive amount of foot traffic in this vast social space which is the civic edge of Lake Wendouree, we, we took them through a series of diagrams to talk about enclosure of that view necessary application of structure and closure of bookshelves and other things that mm -hmm. form a living room, a seat that they could sit in feeling well protected from the view, wrapping the view itself that was wider than the, uh, the quarter acre allotment would normally allow and wrapping that around the house to create a living room window that maybe would somehow exemplify this, this aspect of their life about a very private space that's closely associated with a very civic and very public place. And then drawing that back, that whole strategy of one window then was drawn back into the house itself and every aspect of the house, from its ordering of the spaces within to the nature of the windows, the window reveals, and they're pointing to various aspects of the view, became, became the orchestration of the whole. In the same way that a house that may look out over the ocean and carve up a, a remarkable panoramic view may break that view up into a series of parts that then create moments within uh, the patterns of activity within a house or within some apartments. These are uh, apartment block home apartments we're doing currently in Collingwood. Also we can orchestrate uh, modes of operation within with views beyond. And a farmhouse we're completing down on the Mornington Peninsula. Mm -hmm. yeah, this in its current state is all about a series of views. We map the whole of the Morning Peninsula and as you walk from one part of the house to the other, we've actually set a series of enclosures around different parts of the view. So you engage with the views as you actually associate them with different aspects of life within the house. A very early house then came, um, uh, tunes into another fascination. I think I could again romantically say it comes from uh, my aspects of childhood in Geelong where all of the remarkable wool stores had these incredible skylit roofs and you'll see this constantly with our, with our houses, this appreciation of the fifth elevation or the roof as a, as a means of, of um, drawing in light uh, and commanding uh, an understanding of times of day within the operating uh, diagram of a house. This is one uh, in Kew designed some years ago that draws in east light, starts to discriminate as the sun comes round to the north and then completely uh, excludes west sun into the half of the house. And then a, a foyer in 500 Burke Street and most recently the ceiling at, at MSD for in Melbourne University that again acts for the students to see as a large sort of um, solar compass that you can see the tracks of the sun throughout the day as it draws in morning light and excludes completely the afternoon. Um, we also think we're good observers of things most architects are. I think architects are remarkable researchers. We tend to live a very urban life and are great observers and often bring to um, our clients the ready research of, of people who observe uh, our city. This was, I'm showing you two uh, 
favourite losing competition things of ours tonight. This is one of them, our, our failed bid with Grimshaw Architects uh, for the Flinders Street Rail competition. But here, just like to touch on a couple of aspects, we observed those remarkable bar, uh, banana alley and the, the remarkable brick edge of uh, the either side of, of this precinct and thought we'd let's create our own series of vaults and, and as if they are a small family's home to reduce the scale but actually pinpoint different parts of the view across the Yarra as these radiating points of perspective shift along the length of the new vaults. And appreciate that Melbourne is a series of uh, is a city of civic ceilings. We have many civic ceilings that draw together social activity, and perhaps we could provide a new one on Flinders Street. But however, that also becomes uh, an observation of the process of making. This is one of the things that will come, come constantly through so many of the projects uh, tonight. Uh, this is our living room in Melbourne. Uh, Centred there is a, a painting of Gareth Sampson's, and Gareth describes it. It's the arrogance of an artist railing about the term craft in, in a fairly derogatory manner. But in fact, in Gareth's words, most of the great creative artistic developers have been underpinned by remarkable technological shifts in the process of making art by craftspeople who've walk, work, worked alongside them. And that was his thesis in the making of this. I'm an avid collector of things, an obsessive collector of things. We have houses full of stuff. Nothing particularly that expensive or valuable, but particularly things that sign proce the process <laughs> of, of making. Because the process of making tells us so much about who we are and what, what a society is. So just the things that happen to be in our living room uh, process, the very authentic places which they were designed, considered, collaborations were made and the technological invention developed to make them particularly authentic in a particular place at a particular time. It's this thing, this fascination that intrigues me particularly. It has been the foundation for our settlement in Stoke-on-Trent. It's there because Josiah Wedgwood and others found the clay pits and then harnessed the remarkable technology of the Industrial Revolution to make ceramics in Stoke-on-Trent in the same way that Geelong is a wool town and the woolen mills and the wool stores were there that were part of our uh, primary architectural formatting as part of the wool industry in Geelong. These patterns of settlement are so much about the process of making or traditionally have been. So I do lament a loss. This is, my, this is Keith McKay, one of my favourite people who's retired for business after four generations um, a year and a half ago, who made so much of the work of our practice for so long. Uh, the global economy doesn't support uh, the remarkable hand-wrought skills of organisations such as this. So there's definitely a strong sense of loss that we feel. Keith has made things like this, a jewellery box of Susan Wardle, <coughs> made some years ago out of uh, celery top pine that his father had stacked in the racks 45 years earlier. Um, these sorts of stories are fast uh, losing part of our story as a practice of architecture. However, it's not all melancholic. There's some remarkable aspects of what we do as a practice and what so many practices engage with and now perhaps a more direct association between the digital skills of our office and, and the digital coding that is then provided directly to the cutting, bending and forming machines in industry and in ways new, new forms of craftsmanship are made, new craftsmen and craftspeople come to um, the edict of creating architecture and new forms of making are advanced. So um, it's, it's an interesting aspect of this moment where we are. In fact, in some ways, I think you would almost skip the 20th century. The 20th, 20th century was all about exactness in repetitive mass production. So we were finding there was a reduction in type as, as um, large-scale manufacturing processes could provide exactness, something which is a, a essential part of much of what architects do, but in, the, but in a reduced and um, repeated feel like the massive curtain walls of large buildings. Probably the sort of things we can do at the moment with digital technologies is more like the craft and fused technologies back in the 18th and early 19th century when the processes of craft were uh, most closely aligned with processes of technology. So reasons to be um, optimistic. Um, also at the same stage. But it is good note to know 
the frailties as well as the strengths of the global economy that we take part in. We do work a lot with those. It's something I feel particularly pleased with and so much of our work and the, the nature of our work is expanded by working alongside artists uh, in many, particularly many of our public programs here with our Hawke built in South Australia with Fiona Hall. A great friendship was developed there over two years with Fiona and we took her with us to Brisbane and she did a marvellous, a remarkable four-storey high digital artwork for uh, the Queensland Brain Institute. Danny Marty at Westfield on Market Street. Peter Hennessy in, up in the Sky Lobby in the JBP Morgan Tower. Uh, Simon Perry, uh, a great friend of mine, head of sculpture at RMIT, that we brought him to design this remarkable winking gateway into a Melbourne laneway that we involved in, into our Sydney competition as part of our win there and to create this remarkable bronze gateway. Into a quick story about Gareth Sampson. We were invited by Gareth and his wife Christine, both artists, to design a house. It's the first house design that we had. I showed <coughs> them both. We built models, we took, but we, in our enthusiasm, we sort of worked away from the brief and an understanding of our client as a pair of artists. Um, Gareth seemed to be getting redder and redder the more I described the, um, the design term until in a point of absolute anger reached out and said, you know, something about the NGV and showing his works and not and things, and I just designed a house with curved walls where you couldn't show in a single one of his works. <laughs> um, in fact, it wasn't as weak as that. All the side walls were meant to actually take the works. But anyway, rather than sack us on the spot, we came back, we designed a house for Gareth, but I made sure I, I implanted the arch of the NGV at the point where, where the, their combined studios um, linked with the living rooms and so every time they um, leave the process of making art to where they live and display art that's through this remarkable port of this great um, 20 metre diameter arch that separates the two and then all of the resulting spaces that come out of that um, retort. To Simon Perry and our latest work we've just commissioned and Simon's uh, Put, uh, placed on our property down at Bruny Island that I'll touch on later. To a, a work I'm particularly proud of, uh, we were given a, a $20,000 grant uh, to move to the city uh, when we won our QV project. Um, but as part, uh, part of it in our application for this grant from the City of Melbourne, I talked, I waxed lyrical about our practice moving from uh, Carlton as it was then into the centre of the city and now the, the endeavours of our labour you know, shining a light onto this degraded part of Russell Street in the city. I, I must have, we wrote too much and when the Mayor handed over to Sarah in the city this check, the, the commentary was that was a remarkable thing. They're talking about the illuminating this part of the city, how are you going to do that? And I just wanted to grab a check that was meant to help us move into the city and spent on internal revenue. But in the end, I thought, oh, maybe we should spend part of it on something, and um, this was our old <laughs> office there in Russell Street. At the end of the year, after contacting um, Peter Kennedy, um, we spent $30,000 on the neon, $10,000 on the electricians, ten on the carpenters, and whoever else was the most extravagant thing at that time we'd ever done. So as we moved offices, the first thought was would our new office, this is a building that we bought, in Rokeby Street in Collingwood, would our new offices accept Peter's artwork? We got him to redo it, recalibrate the whole thing, and it now wraps around two small streets in the heart of gritty Collingwood. So in our move to Collingwood, we looked into the history, the history of the site, particularly a remarkable history of the site, the original um, site of, of um, Foster's Brothers Brewery when they came out to America to s establish their new brewery in Australia became a paint company and then the CSIRO's printing works and had its own remarkable history that we feel that we have drawn into uh, the architectural character of a building that's part of the rapid change from an industrial precinct to a small commercial hub. So commerce was what we applied to it, a small cafe, um, spacecrafts, uh, production studio, bus projects, artist studios and gallery <coughs> all shared space with us as we contain ourselves within both the new building and the existing paint factory in this gritty part of Collingwood. And most um, recently Cameron Robbins has been an artist in residence 
with his wind drawings over a God, I don't know how many months camera was coming in out with his um, wind drawing machine to create these, this work as part of the latest of a series of projects we've undertaken in Rokeby Street. Memory is a thing we often draw upon, our own memory and those, the collective memory of public projects or the mem particular memory of a group of clients. This is an image I like for, put together for a recent exhibition. It's a shoe I bought, a pair of shoes that I've never got rid of. Joseph Saba brought some Japanese fashion to Melbourne in 1986, the year I started the practice, and this pair of remarkable Japanese shoes caught my eye. I wore them for a while and I've covered them ever since, and recently bought this perforated porcupine vase that Josiah Wedgwood made in 1810. Mm. There's something about the serendipitous nature of these two things that both contemporises one and places the other very much in its moment in history. So at an older project of ours, and again discussing with a client the, the aspect of their history to create a foundation and so a sense of gravitas for contemporary architecture. So when we looked at these august and beautiful very early educational buildings in South Yarra it became obvious to us and then we related it to the client that for all their formality and, and uh, classical Victorian form and symmetry, the stuff of their making was completely random, the ashlar qualities of Melbourne's basalt. And all of the windows were multi-plane windows and maybe our conversation that a new building could have would be to combine those two aspects and we could upscale the ashlar quality of the brickwork change its materials, subvert it into steel and glass, and create a building of a massive multi-plane window that contained various aberrant moments within the scheme that became the uh, new Ashlar facade for this part of the more outward focus campus. A very recent project, one that is just going through uh, council permit at the moment, around the corner from us in Collingwood, is a new home for ESOP. So our first thing was to look at what, would, could, what could, was being retained in the area in those precious moments of the industrial heritage that's rapidly being lost in Melbourne and see if we could provide a new building that pronounced itself uh, as pretty much part of that gritty inner urban industrial character. So we looked at the nature of the laneways, those that had been lost and those that should be retained, the early patterns of the subdivision and, and the subdivision of Collingwood had changed many times over in its first uh, 50 years or so. And then the things that were lost, and one thing that's particularly interested me is this aspect of the sawtooth roof. So the idea of providing buildings and companion, companion buildings rather than just rapidly changing the scale into one large building, and providing some, something that signposted the remnants of the things that were both being retained in part or completely lost, such as its brick fabric and the sawtooth roofs became part of our conversation with ESOP. So a series, so we descaled, it's a 15 storey building, a massive building for this area, but the part that actually pronounced that, that, that sits on the main street is a smaller part, a small companion building. In discussion with ESOP about their history, we said ESOP stores, I asked them, that the stores are all such small places wherever they are around the world. And it is almost like the culture of a, that has a particular fine scale to it, but you're now a massive organisation. How do you how do you work with that? And they said, that's our big issue. That's our biggest single talking point in ESOP. And so we thought, almost like a sense of essence, uh, maybe we could create a small building that was the essence building for the larger ESOP. So the small building that has the, um, the uh, sawtooth roofs, has, every, has everything about the essence of ESOP on the city, on, the, on Wellington Street. The retained buildings are all retained around it and um, the large building that houses uh, the entire population of ESOP and others, they, they are the majority can but don't fill the building, sits above. So in this front building is gallery, laboratories, and, uh, and all of the meeting spaces, a very discreet foyer, which is a very ESOP thing to do, public place making, or, uh, of terracotta seats and so many things, and then pronouncing onto this side street of Northumberland Street, this vast vertical showcase a uh, sawtooth roof that's been displaced and run vertically up its leeward wall and on top of roof garden. So in the middle of Gritty Collin, they, they, um, they have their own completely private roof garden that looks nowhere but up other than through two very small circular windows. To um, uh, another material on, on, on memory and materials, and it, I've included this tonight because it has a 
it's, a, it's about sometimes the fragments of memories. We don't, as architects, we're great generalists, I think, at our best. We're sort of fabulous generalists, and we generally draw in um, moments of understanding and, and broad research into the things that we do. And here in our failed competition bid, I should acknowledge uh, uh, John here tonight, who's, who, uh, his firm, who does DCM, actually had the winning bid for this competition. Um, this is our, we're one of the five, and five invited entrants into that competition. But it, what I'm going to talk about tonight, it's about just a moment of history. I did notice one thing, that Australia had a terracotta industry now lost, um, and it was created by the influx of Italian immigrants at the start of the 20th century. So we look very carefully at coloration, both that of, the, of Australian sheds and the nature of Venice and the Veneto and the terracotta forms, working with a long-time collaborator of ours and a friend of mine, Simon Lloyds. We, I think this is where we're starting to lose very quickly in our presentation. We invented a whole system of making this building. So it was to be Australian ingenuity, uh, Australian ochres that would go back to the Veneto because they're suffering the same problem that we already have in Australia. They're losing their terracotta industries, both the little ones in the small towns and the large ones in the large cities that used to predominate as a primary form of employment and, and artisanship, they're losing them rapidly, particularly in this northern part of Italy. So we created a system to make our building from the, there it is in, in its um, canal side elevation. Uh, it's open entry with these two, these, these two battened forms. We etched into it, as we like doing, form the words Australia. Um, and the front elevation, the, the, the Point where it sort of looks where, where the speaker would stand, it looks suspiciously like an Australian barbecue. It's not meant to be because <laughs> the whole form of it is just vaguely suggestive of, of uh, the, the, the silhouette of, um, of the closest Palladian villa to the Veneto. Going from there is um, an interesting aspect of the nature of perspective, and this is uh, one of my interesting life stories. Many years ago, after graduating, I travelled through Europe with then girlfriend, now wife, Susan. We uh, went to Vicenza um, and wanted to visit the Tetra Olimpica and had a remarkable occurrence as we walked in with the only people there. And as if somebody had put money in a slot, walked in and sat down in these seats to see Palladio and Chamuzzi's remarkable work with this uh, theatre, with its it's, it's uh, integrated sets with this enforced perspective. Um, as we walked in, this obviously elderly Italian voice speaking English with an American accent started to talk to us and talk about the, about the work of the building that we were seeing, but also the nature of perspective and talked long and hard about perspective itself and then said, perspective is obviously a, often an, a sighted characteristic of our perception of space, but it also has... Um, there is also oral perspective, and he started to walk. We'd see glimpses of him crossing from one street into the next of these remarkable sets, and his voice would carry and disappear and, and move and merge as he walked through these sets. And then he walked out to the front of the stage and looked up and continued his recitation. But he's looking straight ahead, and we were over here, and we realised we just learnt a lesson on perspective from a blind man. So it was a remarkable sort of learning about this aspect of, of what architects do in the work that we do and the many, um, the many we, we obviously generally sort of err toward um, the visual and how important other aspects, that you do oral aspects, can be. So, sometime after, and now uh, two years ago, we decided to enter a competition for uh, a tapestry. This is why I'd like to combine these two projects. The Australian Tapestry Workshop, probably the most beautiful space in Melbourne for those of you who haven't visited it, um, uh, and the remarkable work, work they do and through Peter Williams, who was then in charge of the, the committee or council, uh, suggested they should make tapestry more interesting to architects, and so why did they have a, an architectural competition? We entered it, and the speculation was that it was to be in um, DCM's new pavilion. Um, and so we decided to create, see if we could go into a pavilion, into one space, but be somewhere other. So we invented an imaginary building, which is based on reversing everything that Scamozzi did with those, those uh, exaggerated perspectives outward. And we created a little object, as if it was a house or something, but 
drew the perspective toward the viewer. Then we cast light through it, and the light was meant to suggest something other than the pretense of sort of daylight, the suggestion that there might be a canal around the corner but you can't see it, and the movement of light and the tonality and the shift throughout the day to create this rather subtle work in our lack of knowledge completely and how to make it a tapestry to produce the most difficult tapestry that they've ever undertaken. <laughs> uh, a remarkable client that I'm about to tell you about then paid entirely, entirely for the whole tapestry, Judith Nielsen. Here we are seeing something that in our work, um, I should acknowledge a uh, staff member, Alex Peck and I worked um, uh, pretty closely together on this and then continue to sort of wag work and coming to the Victorian Capacity Workshop to watch it being done. So for all of the digital work we've done here is this hand-drawn cartoon uh, interpreting uh, our computer-generated drawings. Uh, remarkable. So taking from everything in, in, in the pixelated form of our computer-generated renderings into pixels of uh, weft and warp. And there it is being made. Um, and it's just uh, it's quite a remarkable form and it's moved everywhere. It's just been up in Brisbane, it's now in Sydney. They've had dinners around it, we launched a book around it at the MSD in Melbourne University. So it's been a great uh, part of our recent history. Um, another competition, this one, uh, one that we successfully won with NADA, friends of ours from Boston. We had a small practice uh, steeped in Northern American academia. Um, and we came together to look at a bridge in this part of Melbourne. What was interesting to us here was again the history, particularly the history of Speaker's Corner, largely unknown at the end of Birung Ma, for a bridge that had to link the city via Fed Square and Birung Ma to Melbourne Park and the Tennis Centre. So it's 400 metres long from start to finish. It has to take peak loads uh, of those weeks from the Tennis Centre on, but, but also part as, with a particular third stage of work, part of the diagram of the map of pedestrian activity throughout Melbourne. We look very carefully at what is often bad about bridges, which is the undercroft, so we bent from, we pushed uh, the alignment that was suggested in the competition brief to push it hard into an embankment, to actually then have it climb up the embankment to form part of a series of network of experiences uh, on its journey. We like the idea that it was also part of the rail system and looked at, we looked at the idea of designing something that could have a myriad of understandings, that this filigree process was very much like uh, the finer branches of the elm trees that would pass through at canopy height, and we, and we did design the bridge during the winter months and that was most apparent, but also the kind of filigree, st converting that to the sort of filigree steelwork that we see when we look across at the rail yards and appreciate the remarkable engineering and architecture of those rail systems. So it's a building that hugs the ground, pushes away from the straight journey to uh, rise up against this uh, cycad embankment of, um, of the gardens. It changes direction, sits on, across a, on a series of columns that appear to walk themselves to cross the road, veers off into another alignment. Uh, there's another place that will then link further on with the city past Fed Square East if it's ever built, creates an upper dress circle above um, Speaker's Corner so that we've added, hopefully, to the capacity of those few forlorn people who ever stand there on a box to <laughs> next to no crowd and, and have their say. And then leaps across the bridge, uh, across Batman Avenue and into Melbourne Park. So another project, this is for David Walsh and Kersha Khalil, uh, who own Mona in, in Tasmania. That's a project, a project we've been involved, uh, involved with for the last two years, around this small cottage, a small stone cottage, the part on the left, um, that was built in the 1850s at Marshwheel on the east coast of Tasmania. We set up a datum, we're removing a lot of the areas that have been constructed in the 20th century, a datum of river, floor line and the pitching point of the veranda that have been lost, we're going to recreate that veranda, but that becomes our sort of device for ordering of everything of a much larger program around this very humble cottage. So the recreation of that small veranda inside the house becomes something much larger, it becomes inhabited veranda as we move to the left there to a new accommodation wing, and as we stretch round 
um, it becomes an inhabited bridge across to a bathhouse that spans across the other side of a river and links with the ocean. It came out of a fabulous conversation with David, you tend to have, when he demanded that we fit baths into these small bathrooms in the historic home, and I pleaded that we can't, they can't fit in. Well, we'll have to have a bathhouse. Then I thought, well, while we're in a roll, I said, why don't we put the bathhouse on the other side of the, of the river, then we can have a bridge to the bathhouse. So, <laughs> <laughs> like an ongoing game of chess. So it's a very large project, there's about 16 buildings. I'm just going to talk to you about one of them. So here is the whole scheme, and there's performance spaces and artist studios and places, uh, uh, make it, places for people to come and make. In fact, it will be made out of the first thing that's going to be built, which is a large maker's studio for ceramics and steel and timber and other things that will come into this. And then it leaves crossing the bridge across. So the, 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 the roof itself, it all comes out of that historic roof, seems to disfigure and extend across the river to a bathhouse. So in our discussion about the bathhouse, we thought, well, maybe we could have the two um, opposing parts of the experience of water. It's most profound and often violent way of water um, descending from the heavens, either in the form of thunder or um, a waterfall. Um, we referred to Bill Bowler's Tristan's Ascension that I've been up to Sydney to see, for those of you who went and saw that all those years ago, it's such a remarkable uh, work. It would be part of that character and maybe out of that make a very Tasmanian sense of, a, of the bitter cold of a, of a waterfall that you'd experience upon arrival and then the tranquility of the water in its horizontal state in a serene pool. So, and David talked about falling water, the buildings is our version. Um, a series of interlocking circles become reminiscent of the Mandelbrot set. David's a mathematician, uh, foremost, a remarkable one, and so these sorts of things are our way into his heart. Um, of a series of interlocking circles, so you have a journey across the bridge, lose yourself to find the front door, come into the larger form and through there to the small one that contains the pool that's a cantilever across the river. So we come across the bridge, hopefully in the middle of winter, in a foggy morning, find uh, the door. Now this rhythm that's been correct is still the rhythm, the three metre spacing of the random post on the historic uh, uh, cottage that we followed <coughs> across the bridge. Now they are now they are rendered in concrete in this cloud-like perimeter of the, of the structure into round the corner to find the entry on the far side of the building and through a very small entry portal and through there's a first floor with all treatment rooms and, and saunas and, uh, and uh, massage places and so forth then into the large centre where this uh, 11 metre high waterfall is addressed saunas and other things then through into the waterfall which is cold water from a warm pool then into uh, to the very warm pool, which is part of a much larger, but it's a small pool within a larger pool. The impression is that you're in the large pool, but in fact you're a circle within a circle that's cantilevered over the river. Um, as it was here, and then it orients itself back to the homestead at that point. It's the small gold brooch that we made for them after we signed off the process. <laughs> <laughs> So again, a collective memory. Uh, we were asked to um, be the, the first, to now what, will be a, what is being a series of architects to design the Summer Pavilion for the NGB. Um, and out of ours, and this conversation back in the office, and a recall of a, of a poem uh, of C.J. Dennis's when he was uh, commissioned to write a poem at the, at the opening of the Sydney Harbour Bridge and he wrote, I dips my lid to the Sydney Harbour Bridge. And we, so we thought playfully we could dips our lid to the Sydney Maya Music Bowl, <laughs> translating it from one Sydney for another. But what it really was, was very seriously looking at a remarkable in, a, a bit of benefaction and one of the great civic spaces of our city and it's even more remarkable structural engineering system of that type. And we thought maybe we could take the form of it, but then adopt a, a, and then shift from a, 19, uh, from a 20th to a 21st century structural <laughs> system. The structural system would need more. And we, again, this feeling that Australia is a, a place of civic ceilings. We congregate under civic ceilings, whether they be Leonard French or Billy Griffin and Murray, Murray and Marnie's. 
um, we can create a ceiling that's set inside a new <coughs> structural form. Now remember, the hurry, the MGV, we did this image, which you'll, if you notice, we sort of got the idea of the ceiling right, but we had no sense of structure, and they demanded something to send out to the world to pronounce this, so that went out before we had any work at all done on the structural system. So there was a lot of working very quickly at a, at a grid shell system. <laughs> But also, as we like doing, investing in the finding out of the small crafts that are, that are around in our city. So from fashion, the few remaining stud makers that worked in our jeans industry, to this remarkable polypropylene, fully recyclable material, the same material we use for our banknotes, then made the system of enclosure of our civic ceiling with its coloration that suggests it span from spring to autumn. It stayed up for eight months or so, a year ago. To Bruni Island, we have a family farm on Bruni Island, and uh, after 12 years or so of planting 9,000 trees, we decided to get on and actually do uh, something, a building. The first of these, and after the speculation of this photo at the top, a very hazy photo of the old house and shearing shed from 1940, when they were already over 100 years old, came into a conversation, is that shearing shed a skin or a gable? And it was just a playful thing, well maybe it could be both. Those two primary and primitive forms of agricultural structure, from, and we could perhaps do um, this shearers quarters, which is to our really, would, would house shearers, but pretty much us and friends and, and the office, um, in this small uh, enclosure that is both skin and gable. So the speculation was a single structure that could could transfer from uh, skin at one point upon arrival to gable at the point where it engaged most of the three gables of the historic cottage. As you arrive, uh, this, the old cottage, as you'll see shortly, was built by Captain James Kelly, the founding founder of Tasmania's whaling industry in the 1830s, late 1830s. Um, and he built it right on the edge of a cliff. A farmer was built up on the main road, she built it on a cliff. So, the long drive winds down to this point, and the first point of intersection is its most prosaic and shed-like as you turn the corner, becomes much more suggestive of something that contains uh, human occupation. The various <laughs> parts of that <laughs> accord with the nature of place. Uh, the remarkable skills evident in this part of Southern Tasmania, particularly carpentry skills, but also fabulous steel fabrication then became part of our knowledge base that we employed in the making of this small house. In a moment in history, it's halfway done, and I've, I've been collecting te old technology, which interests me, and uh, this had been a large um, commercial apple orchard up until 1970 when England joined the common market and killed Tasmania's apple industry overnight. And all the old apple sheds that I'd visited around the area had piles and piles of this brand new boxwood that was ready to make the next day's box boxes when they actually literally closed the industry overnight. So I collected it all, with the whole lot for the, these cross walls run right throughout the house, I, I, it cost about $60 for the lot, <laughs> been used for kindling for 45 years, <laughs> and developed this uh, shingle pattern and all the cross walls are clad in that, something that really is, its primary function is to suggest the social, one of the social histories of this region, and the bunk room where the lowest level of the social hierarchy of shearers congregate as if it's a large breezeway in the places that they're most used to. And there is that, and then most recently, after 18 months of arduous effort of restoring the old and extending the old cottage, we've now completed the works of Captain Kelly's cottage that faces the cliff as it has for so long. So scale, this is a thing we often discuss, we talk about the scale of our practice, and I should acknowledge here then a series of joint venture partners, and so many times we think we expand the nature of practice by venturing off with others. We also look at the, the transference of ideas through sh shifting scales, and the suggestion that the sorts, of, uh, act, the sorts of dynamics of a small family home can be expanded upon as we observe the, uh, the coalition of social activity into a much larger civic realm, or well, the kinds of the things that pronounce the civic spaces can be also drawn into our understanding of the dynamics of a family home. 
So here, one of these silly little projects is um, a basin with, uh, I mentioned Simon Lloyd before, a friend of mine, he and I have worked for the last year and a half on a series of vases. I think it's the only hobby I've ever had. And in those few other hours, we've started to develop from a series of sketches of my systems vases. They're three vases that work on the process of the nurturing of a bunch of flowers over the short life. So they are all about pouring out and changing the water and topping it up in this process of, of, um, of the nature of the short life of a bunch of flowers. And here they are, they contain too much, so much complexity you can't find anybody in the world anywhere who wants to make them. But <laughs> <laughs> they have just two days ago been shortlisted in a really remarkable ceramics competition in, in Japan. I'm not sure where they'll go from here, but this is the first one and it has means of, of lifting it up, a reservoir and a, and a jug that actually uh, allows the water to be topped up. And there it is in its prototypical form. And it does so much in the same way buildings that we design have different con constituent parts. It's a vase that does the same sort of thing, so it's very much an architect's vase. <laughs> <laughs> to a larger building, uh, just a small part of a larger building, our LTB project, a massive project we're doing for Monash University at the moment. We talk about a low flat building that will draw light through a, a remarkable roof scape and then uh, an extended ground plane. So the landscape forms that, that, are, that sit at the perimeter of this space are drawn up to a series of spaces that harness the social activity of this coalition of students. Again, a distraction in the family holiday to Stoke-on-Trent and, and to just to see these remarkable bottle kilns. And then later a conversation with the Vice-Chancellor that talked about the parallels between um, the vigour and long-lastingness of the high firing of ceramic clay to make ceramics is akin to the tertiary education effects on young <coughs> students. It has become part of our idea for these large kilns that are the centrepiece of the collaborative learning spaces within um, this massive building in one of our ceilings above and the way that will appear. Multiplex, it's $270 million of work of work, multiplex a building in 14 months and, and they're on target. It's something that's rapidly changing by the week. To another project we've extended ourselves by joining with others, with Durback Block Jaggers, great friends of ours in Sydney and joining on uh, the Phoenix Gallery, a large private art gallery and performance space for Judith Nelson, who paid for that uh, tapestry and a remarkable and generous project that she has invested in. Dubek Block are designing the performance space and it's very much their work. We're designing the, the gallery and it's ours, but we've come together, we've freely criticised each other's work in the most remarkable and hilarious means. We have these constant associations and we've together designed the front elevation that reflects the programs and attitudes and architectural values of both practices, but something uh, that comes together to provide, we think, a cohesive whole. So for our part of it, it's the way we can um, mark territory and observe the nature of materials as if dropping uh, a small droplet of water on a sheet of paper, but in this case brickwork, it forms a pool, a second droplet creates a splash, to create a second moment in that pool, together by then creating vertically, we've created the dimple, that impression, and these two uh, moments of the collection of water. It seems such an simple idea, it's caused the most complex de com uh, documentation that's ever come out of our office for this massive four-storey high dimple wall, these two ocular windows. We know we're part of the passage of time and the way such windows have worked to, to um, be an open invitation for these sorts of programs throughout history. And then the other aspect, again, of our fascination with this fifth, eleva fifth elevation, the ingress of light, the most complex skylights that we've ever created. We look pretty carefully at the nature and the grid-like process of making skylights, and then try to come with an idea of fuzzy light that we projected in this first image that we presented to Judith for the, the major gallery on the top floor. The work of Norio Imai, uh, the artist who often displaces form by approximating it, by wrapping another veil around a known object uh, to both disfigure and abstract 
something that to us is very familiar, and as if we could do the same thing but rather than fine fabric uh, with a hard material, but treating a hard material like a fine fabric, so brickwork like fabric that then pushes around the impression of those skylights and the large uh, dimpled windows <coughs> that it occurs to give clues into a space that's very private, it's very much a private gallery and private performance space, but one where there's an open invitation, such as with this house museum, to invite others in. And as we do, as a uh, Kraus Brickwork uh, makers, a uh, three generation small brick company that we just about keep in business, they do all the brickwork for that Monish project. Like Alchemy, they bring together the clay from four different quarries that span two states to the brickwork for that front elevation. And here we are with the test panels of how to just very subtly shift brickwork into that very fine. <coughs> And what I like about this section, it shows for all of the coming together, this wonderful collegiate relationship between ourselves and Jurbak Block, the inner world of their gallery is so much of the sort of fascination that the Durback Block bring to such projects, and the gallery reflects very much our values and understanding of the client's brief. The cabinet of curiosities will look very much um, uh, at the means of access through and the means of experiencing. Um, uh, the, the various areas of her collection. So from an oculus, so the idea of drawing light through has become a fascination. So two stories under the ground is our ocular gallery that draws in light from above, from the mm -hmm. courtyard space. Then up through the shared ground platform. And in the journey through, through um, two means, it's a loop of space. So up on those perimeter stairs with pushed into the wall of these two teeny little galleries, one at landing, one at the top of the stairs, that there's room only for one person to look at one small object as a distraction as you make the journey upwards. Uh, and into a suspended video gallery, um, uh, cladding tiles from Tokoname, from the tile factory that Frank Lloyd Wright set up in Japan in the 1920s with his joint venture partners and still going beyond the Imperial Hotel that he created at that time. And then looking at a series of means of by lift and two separate staircases, and one lift itself is a gallery space. It's clad with a you know, in a glass gallery chamber um, that are the means of uh, of the journey through all of these spaces, up to the very top floor, and through two different means, a very circuitous journey around uh, the central form, where we start to see the suggestion of the skylight above areas above. The door that opens up to reveal a library and the inner view of the ocular window out to, toward Chippendale in the heart of Sydney. It's the same sort of intrigue with mode of operation and um, invited views in. Our Conservatorium of Music building that very much was a, a building that didn't want to be in a very public place if you were to invite discussion with these remarkable people that teach the very exacting processes of music education. This primary requirement is acoustic separation from the world above. So how to create a building that want, intentionally wants to be insulated and separated from uh, a, a very important part of the of Melbourne civic realm. So we, uh, we described our competition bid as an open invitation we looked at how we could actually then choreograph whatever parts we possibly could of their rather inward program and draw it out to the street frontage on Sturt Street and create a place. We pushed, we, we did a master plan originally for the campus uh, and we pushed this, uh, the, the footprint onto actually the one bit of building that the university didn't own so that we could create a public park that would actually be like a surgeon's scalpel cutting right into the heart of the campus that's on Dodd Street, one street in. So the public park then also animates the building and creates the setting of a space that wasn't in their brief, which is a, an external amphitheatre, like so many of the, of the grand parks of the original foundation of Melbourne and so many cities, is a, is a, is a public music pavilion, second a park. Through to the Studio One, the major performance space at ground level. In my enthusiasm and presentation of the judge, we talked about this window rolling away. Mm -hmm. could have, it could have slid, but uh, rolling away has become part of our quest. Apologies to Hogarth, the idea that we wanted to invite views in by, but at the same time, 
provide uh, a level of, of security to the prime purpose of those within the building. So the, sig the signal of this is this one precast wall that draws around and gathers public curiosity and draws that in through an arch into the inner world of the building. I'm looking very carefully at the way we can create oculise these large windows on Sturt Street, but if you look at the section there, they look very much like as if we purposely designed them as you know, a, a reference to a, a, an item of woodwind or a, the end elevation of a trumpet, but in fact they were really part of a, a pleading with our acoustic engineers, maybe we could have some windows that are very big on the public side and very small on the performer's side, and that's the, and that's the way they came out. So this series of small windows in various family sizes will um, orient the activities of the building towards Sturt Street. And this series of the three performance spaces then are stacked on a, well, it's a very vertical music academy with the entrance is again through um, like a rather half-like um, uh, <coughs> entry portal into those, prim you know, those primary spaces. So, Again, everything is drawn to this large cruciform and every level, the collaborative spaces are drawn to this one intersection of the streets that sit within the smaller spaces above. And the most public place within the building on level three is drawn right across the street frontage. And, th and the building appears to peel away to open invitation uh, to observe the inner world. To our, one of our other curiosities, again, with uh, tile makers in Tokaname was uh, um, a finer system where the finer grain, as if uh, the notation on the compositional sheet of, of music or the way music is broken into the smallest uh, emblematic parts to provide these small moments in a very large facade of tiles that will sit in, in these recesses of this massive facade. So from within Studio One at ground level, at the pronouncement of every performance, the window will in fact roll away to become part of uh, the opening sequence, the, the major space which is akin to the Milba Hall on the other campus creates uh, the major performance space and here drawn out and it's to, the, to the, uh, the viewing aperture into the public realm. Finally, not making and making as architects. Um, I never confuse the two. People often ask me if there's some aspect of school craftsmanship that I engage with. Absolutely none. none. I've never made anything particularly. But we are a firm that has always remarked on appreciating the skills of others. So as part of that, we've recently or just opened last Thursday a massive uh, exhibition of our work in Sydney. If anybody's travelling to Sydney, the Tin Sheds Gallery on City Road is this... Um, a work that we, uh, our staff, essentially built, it contains the tapestry, uh, but various references to the work of others. We commissioned 12 Australian photographers. We gave each of them two buildings, essentially, uh, intently, two separate buildings, asked them to take one photo of each, bringing their own stories to find commonality between two buildings. And it's, it's much more about their work than ours, and for us it's been a fantastic um, observance to see others working within that very small aspect of a brief that we gave them. So our staff have um, designed and erected all of the display of that and it opened last Thursday night. But as part of what we do, and this is we've just completed the second of these, we had many years of taking the staff down to plant trees in Tasmania. Was, the word got back to me that after 9,000 trees and nearly a decade of planting, in the middle of winter in Tasmania, that they're over that one and we have to do something else. <laughs> so in the way these things often happen, it started as a very simple idea and one sketch of mine, and that maybe we could get a couple of carpenters and we could learn how to do a bit of carpentry as the idea progressed over about a month, and ended up we engaged uh, a stonemason, an arborist, two carpenters, uh, a specialist wood cutter, uh, and we started to make things. So in the we, in the big machinery shed we have down there, we started to make a style, a bridge and various things. I got a local neighbour with a great big D9 to pull apart a hillside. We employed a stonemason to show the staff how to rebuild into something other. We ate a lot around a hut that we built some years ago. Prefabricated a bridge, 
met the locals. <laughs> <laughs> I would have to say as much as, as I remark on the wonders of this place and others like it, the North Bruny Island Beer Can Chainsaw Museum is a step ahead of all of you. Yeah. <laughs> this is Justin Jones, Akas Chainsaw, who's, who's both uh, director and curator of, of that institution, <laughs> a dear friend of ours. Some years ago, we provided pro bono services to the local, local community and 40 completely unskilled volunteers um, uh, looked at our drawings, put them back in the ute, and built a city, uh, a, a hall, art gallery, cafe, and shop. And they put on a large dinner for us there. We built the bridge. We walked down and placed it across the creek. The style, the sort of the scale issue here: you walk up two and a half metres to cross over a metre high fence. <laughs> <laughs> the stone project and fire pit, the bird observation platform. <laughs> There we were, that was year one, and most recently, we've just been back three weeks ago, I bought a job lot of terracotta tubes, uh, 2,000 terracotta tubes, not knowing what I'll do with them. We <laughs> built um, a, I think it is Southern Tasmania's largest sundial. <laughs> there it is. And with a vein. Uh, a gate uh, and uh, some furniture with a series of... of uh, people that show us how to do all this, stonemasons and bricklayers. We are working away at the, end, the barbecue and fire pit that was part of, that set over the old footings of an old dog kennel that had been removed many years ago. And then each night sat around large bonfires and drank a copious amount of alcohol. And then just to end up on, and I will end now, a small video that Coco and Max, two remarkable young Melbourne filmmakers that we just made for the exhibition. This was finished last Friday. It's got a beautiful soundtrack to it, which we can't put on tonight of both the Shearer's Quarters and now the complete Captain Kelly's Cottage. Thank <laughs> you. 